We've come a long way from the days when no firearms training was provided for law enforcement officers. Rare would be the officer today who did not have some kind of training in the area of deadly force, particularly in the use of the duty pistol. But as that training has evolved, it's seen its share of fits and starts, of transitions that have helped and others that have perhaps hindered the officer in performance of this most serious task. And the evidence seems to show that the majority of methods and approaches we have been employing to prepare our officers to use their handguns in the real world have not been based on the realities of that world. Rather, they have been based on the artificial environment of the training range and focused on preparing our officers to prevail in training rather than combat. Welcome to part three of our Police Pistol Craft series, New Paradigm Tactics and Techniques. The source for this series is the textbook, Police Pistol Craft, the reality-based new paradigm of police firearms training. The author of the book is Mike Conti, former director of the Massachusetts State Police Firearms Training Unit and founder and director of the Sabre Group, which offers law enforcement training and consulting services. Conti has served as our subject matter expert throughout this series. After watching this video, you will be able to describe the purpose and methodology of the Integrated Duty Pistol Training Course concept, describe the purpose and conduct of DPTC Level 1 Skill Builder Training Courses and DPTC Level 2 Marksmanship and Safe Handling Skills Assessment Tests, describe the purpose and conduct of DPTC Level 3 Combination Drills and DPTC Level 4, Scenario-Based Dynamic Interactive Experiential Learning Diminished Light Training, or the House of Horrors. Nice and slow. Remember what you're preparing for. Remember what you're training for. If we figure out people are going to more than likely be involved in a close quarter spontaneous event, then we need to put most of our training emphasis on the skills that allow them to hit a target at close quarters while they're undergoing that stress response. Police firearms training was initially copied from the military model, and even as it evolved, it was based primarily upon the influence of outside sources. Why reinvent the wheel? Why do a whole bunch of work? Because a gun is a gun, and you're shooting a gun, and the guns always go bang the same way, so what's the, what's the big deal? But there was a big deal again. The military mission is different from the civilian police mission. Now, another organization that had an influence on it, too, in the same time period is the NRA. National Rifle Association uh, starts to, to provide some training programs. And there, again, now their influence comes in. But the NRA's mission at the time, when they, when they had people participate in firearms training or firearm shooting uh, competitions or whatever, was just that. You know, they were shooting their weapons and they were shooting at targets and, uh, you know, trying to promote... The, the, the safe use of firearms and, you know, all things we applaud. However, again, the particular mission of the NRA and the types of activities they did at the time was to hit targets. So that's when you have the whole bullseye, NRA bullseye uh, technique being developed where officers stand with, you know, bladed side to the uh, target, pistol extended in one hand, their other hand in their pocket or on the hip, and doing this type of activity here. Though styles and stances and techniques have evolved through the years, the main emphasis has remained basically the same, putting holes in targets from various distances. Yet the facts of the matter don't match the training to prepare for them. 85% of police gunfights take place within seven yards. More than half are when the officer and assailant are five feet or closer, and officers are, on average, missing with more than 80% of their shots. Officers who must achieve 70% or better hits on the range to pass qualification requirements with their weapons can't hit what they're shooting at when real lead starts to fly. What's causing the discrepancy? Why don't we do as good as we do in the real world as we do in the range? Targets, you gotta hit at least 70% usually or better. 
to qualify with your guns, yet in the real world we're hitting maybe 20% or less on average. Uh, the old answers to that, well, of course it's different, you know, I mean, it's different when people are shooting at you. Those answers are gone. Now what we're doing is we've altered the training so it replicates the reality. While target shooting, accuracy, and safe handling are still important elements of any pistol training program, under the new paradigm, they are not the final objective of the training. The meat of the training now is the actual scenario-based training. All of our other training, the different levels of training we have, we have four levels of training. The first three are strictly there to prepare the officer to succeed at the fourth level, which is the dynamic interactive simulation training. And the fourth level is designed to prepare them to survive in the world. Next step up is into the world. So that's how we look at it. You know? The cart is no longer before the horse. The, the training needs are no longer driving the, the training outcome. You know? Now we're looking at the end product, the actual performance in a gunfight. That's now driving the training. That's what the training is built to, to satisfy. Each course of fire is linked to the next, allowing for consistency in the training approach and the techniques employed. In order to ensure that the training program is designed properly and that its goals are reality-based, the new paradigm integrated duty pistol training course concept focuses on the four core elements involved, the people being trained, the equipment they are employing, the environment they will be working in, and the actual mission they are tasked with and officers have to be made aware that the mission they are being tasked with may one day involve shooting another human being. But we can't afford to have people out there who've never considered this or never had to deal with this in training because again there's some mistakes that can only be made once and if they can't shoot when it's time to shoot we haven't prepared them properly to do what they need to do and they die as a result that's on us we own that so again, the training well, we're not training people to go out there to, to kill indiscriminately, but they have to be able to kill if necessary. You know, and again, we're not training them to shoot to kill, we train them to shoot to stop, but again, you put bullets into people's bodies, a lot of times they die. Officers must be psychologically prepared to deal with the realities of a deadly force situation. The psychological conditioning methodologies that are used to accomplish that include stress inoculation, classical conditioning, and operant conditioning. These can be misapplied as well, as evidenced by the way some officers have been conditioned to respond to the threat stimulus target of a man with a gun pointed at them. Stimulus, the man with a gun pointed at the officer. Response, draw and fire. Reward, you hit the target, neutralizing the threat. Reality. We just conditioned our officer to draw and fire against the drawn gun. Now, I don't care how fast you are in the draw, unless you get a lot of luck with you or the shooter on the other side gets distracted. There are not many people in the world who can outdraw a trigger press. Someone has the finger on the trigger, even on the frame, one tenth or three tenths of a second to make it go bang. On a fast, good day, maybe a, if, you, if you're lightning fast, maybe a second. Say you can even get up to a second bang. You're still way behind the power curve. Officers have been killed in the line of duty trying to outdraw a trigger squeeze. Under the new paradigm, reality-based training, stimulus, man with a gun. Response, move to cover while drawing the weapon and engage from behind cover. Reward, safely neutralizing the threat while reducing the danger to yourself. The whole reality-based training paradigm is movement, cover, you know, uh, assessing all the time and breaking that whole range environment the sterile range environment box. So we tell them in level one, we're not counting any holes. This is strictly exercises for them to develop their own skills, to push themselves a little bit. The level one duty pistol training course involves the skill building and reinforcement stage. Officers are told that the holes in their targets will not be counted. This allows them to relax and focus more on the purpose of the drills and the overall training goals. We introduced our officers to various techniques that can be used to deliver rounds to a target. Because we're not mentally conditioning at this point, we're simply training them on physical motor skills, developing their skill levels. We're also not testing them at this level. This is another key part. It's probably one of the more important parts. 
whereas most training activities, old paradigm style training activities, are devoted to uh, documenting performance, you know, qualification courses, whatever, you have to get so many rounds on the target. In that case, people tend to do what's going to get them the holes in the target, and they're going to use old paradigm stylizations and use the sights even when they're not supposed to because they want to hit the target. So we tell them in level one, we're not counting any holes. This is strictly exercises for them to develop their own skills, to push themselves a little bit. We teach them different techniques so that they can use the sights to deliver accurate aimed sighted fire rounds if they have time, distance, cover, or the situation permits. We teach them point shooting, you know, and again, taking the onus off of the number of holes in the target, we let them learn and they have to adjust as they go. So if they're missing a little bit at first until they calibrate, that's fine. And we thought it's normal. And then once they zero in, now they start to stretch a little bit, get better and better, and their confidence builds there too. Is at first level, we've also covered stoppage clearing, all the basic things that they need to keep the gun running and going. Okay. And level two is just simply uh, marksmanship and safe handling skills. Uh, we make sure that they can access and employ their weapons from a variety of uh, positions, positional shooting, they're standing, they're kneeling, they're prone. There's no stress involved in this. Very, very low uprange, no, no uprange stress actually. We're there to help them and guide them through it. No downrange stress. They're still shooting at targets, still developing physical skills, and to a small degree, mental skills, okay? Just again, for control of the weapon, ingraining these different um, actions so they can run the gun safely. So, at the second level, we also are testing them, but what we're testing them on is simply their marksmanship ability, and by marksmanship, I mean the ability to deliver rounds to a target area, preferred target area, using both sighted and non-sighted fire, both aimed fire, but some with the sights, some just point shooting. The emphasis is on the point shooting skills because that's again what we believe they're going to more than likely need. What we're looking at is simply can they handle the gun safely under control conditions? Can they deliver rounds accurately to the preferred target area using the different techniques? And that's about it. That's basically what we're doing. We introduce them to positional shooting, they're standing, they're nailing, they're prone. And again under control conditions so they can learn how to do this. It's usually where other programs will start to wind up. People hit this, maybe they'll hit a little bit of level three. But level two is generally a qualification course. That's how we look at it. But again, we're using it as a piece of the puzzle. It's a step in the ladder. It's not the end of the ladder, or it's not the ladder itself. This particular activity, this level of training, putting the holes in the target, a lot of times for the old paradigm, that was the end of the road. They would do different things, but the whole point of the training was to pass this test. Get enough holes in the paper so you get the check mark so you can go out into the world and go back to work. Okay? With us, it's not. With us, it's simply another aspect, another level. The new paradigm is the entire program to prepare them to operate in the world under real conditions. So, hand on your weapon now, Faker. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. It's not just about hitting the target. It's about not hitting the non-targets, the non-threats, not hitting the friendlies. Uh, it starts to open people's eyes up a little bit, takes them to that next level. Good. 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 Nice good job there, Baker. Good job. You verbalize on your way down. As far as going from the old paradigm to the new paradigm, um, the biggest thing is on emphasis and approach. Our emphasis now is on preparing our people for the realities of the world, not preparing them to succeed at an unrealistic marksmanship-based training activity. So the whole new paradigm approach is basically tipped upside down from the old paradigm approach. Even though there are a lot of similarities, because there's only so many ways to carry, draw, and fire a gun. There's only so many ways to do that. But it's in the psychological approach, and it's on where you place the emphasis on the training. So old paradigm, again, looking for holes in paper targets. New paradigm is looking for a competent, confident, prepared police officer ready to deal with real-world situations. So whereas... The old paradigm usually peaked at the qualification course, or maybe add a little twist to it with like running and gunning, using cover and doing different competition type skills. That's still just another component for us. It's another piece of the puzzle. Developing these same skills that our people need, but for a totally different reason. And you're right in the ballpark. You're right in the ballpark. I saw you tracking like we talked about. Were you on your sights? Were you on your front sight? You don't even remember seeing no. your sights, do you?
Okay. Do you remember tracking? So now we introduce a little bit of stress. We have them dealing with something downrange in front of them. Or we have them dealing with simulated human beings. But again, no actual threat or simulated threat coming to them. Just things where they have to make decisions. Do I shoot this? Engaging a moving target. Very, very realistic scenarios, not some long drawn out thing. They're fast, furious, they have to run, move, gun, take cover, make quick decisions. Opens their eyes up a little bit. For level three are usually very, very tight, um, high yield training courses, but they don't take all day. Boom, 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 and one person at a time goes through them. So whether we have them doing the serpentine drill where they're moving through simulated bodies, mannequins who are innocents, and having to handle the guns correctly and then engage a target while they're moving just to kind of break that. Go! Nice and easy now, hand on your weapon. We have them doing uh, the original level three program where they get out of a cruiser and run down range, take cover behind a vehicle and then engage a target as it moves through friendlies to open their eyes up a little bit more. It's not just about hitting the target, it's about not hitting the non-targets, the non-threats, not hitting the friendlies. Uh, it starts to open people's eyes up a little bit, takes them to that next level. Now, usually, that's where a lot of police training stopped, if it got to that level. It's, it stopped there, some kind of combat course, people will call it, even though there's no combat in it. That's why we don't call it a combat course. Um, so that would cover, cover the third. Third is kind of like the linchpin to the fourth level. Because okay? now we've taken these basic skills, we've introduced movement, we've introduced some judgment into it. You were patient? Did you feel comfortable dumping around into him over here? Ma'am, no, ma'am. With our friendlies? Ma'am, no, ma'am. Absolutely not. You didn't feel comfortable, so you don't do it. Is that a good hit, Best Ma'am, yes, ma'am. And he hits a good hit. That's an outstanding hit. Might that have stopped him? Ma'am, yes, ma'am. Absolutely, absolutely. Telling you that friendlies get hit? Ma'am, yes, ma'am. Look at his eyeballs. Boom, boom. This is a new t shirt for him, Best But look at this. Do our friendlies get hit? Oh, yeah. That was an outstanding, outstanding job. You buy yourself a ticket to the House of Horrors. Now you can get hurt in here for real. I'm not kidding you. You be careful. Now three, they're ready for the fourth level. The the fourth the right level is where they ready? put it all together. One, but two, now three, they're go. dealing with get in, perceived get in. threats coming to them that they've got to negotiate successfully. At the Halloween! <laughs> At the Halloween! <laughs> If one of them presents an immediate threat to you, if you see a gun, then you have got to shut that thing down by shooting it to stop the threat. If you don't, it will shoot you. Curtain opens from the right. Curtain opens from the right. Open it wide. Deal with what's inside. Open it wide. Open it wide. All the physical skills training and psychological conditioning methodologies are blended in level four, the House of Horrors. Who's that? Who's that? In the House of Horrors, stress inoculation is employed by exposing the officers in a controlled manner to the specific types of stressors they can reasonably anticipate encountering in the real world. A lot of times, you can only make the mistake once. Okay, there's some mistakes that can't be made twice. So what we try to do is we try to prepare our people for these types of events through stress inoculation training. So what we do is we put them in the House of Horror. We expose them to a number of simulated events that mirror those that they're most likely to encounter. A person with a gun, a person with a knife coming at them, uh, you know, an officer turning on them with a badge or whatever, because uh, we don't, we're not just training them to shoot all the time, it's when not to shoot as well. And we expose the subconscious to this, as well as the conscious mind. And we let the subconscious mind experience successes going through this training. We teach it what to do and what not to do in order to survive, get the body to survive, but also to do the job appropriately. Ah, good job, good job. Come over here, decock, decock, decock. How do you feel? Physically. Sir. Physically. Sir, breathing heavy. Okay. Now let me ask you a question. You and I went through this thing at the same time, same speed, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How come you're breathing like that and I'm not? I was dealing with the stressor in front of me. That's right, you're dealing with the unknown, I know what's down here. That's when we put our people through House of Horror training, response, right? we're able to initiate what psychologists call a true high arousal state. That means that the systems in our body, the survival-based system, subconscious mind, is activated 
and the human being going through these programs, if you can build the program so there's enough fidelity, enough realism, the people going through it, even though they know it's not real, even though they know that there are dummies like we use in the House of Horror, if the subconscious mind buys into it, if you've prepped them right and you're taking them through it, all of a sudden, as far as the subconscious mind is concerned, these things are all real. We're inoculating them to the stress of these types of situations. We're associating, in classical conditioning, we're associating them moving through the world with a gun in the hand, that with good things, okay? Because they're using it to save lives, good job. Now we're associating the gun with good feelings, okay? Because it's just an inanimate object. But now they're using it, they can use it to good effect, they can save themselves, they can save other people. Now we've created a positive association with the gun. We've created a positive association with their ability to handle situations. And we're operating conditioning them at the same time. They go to a station, there's a specific stimulus. If it's a person presenting an immediate threat, the conditioning response is to shoot and stop the threat. If they stop it, good job, we give them the reward. Right there in the spot. Bang, bang, bang. Stimulus, response, reward. Which one's downrange? Where's there is down no downrange, sir, in the real world. Good man, good man. Give me the gun. Well, let me ask you a question. You breathe a little bit hard. I was with you the whole way, yes? Sir, yes, sir. How come I'm not breathing hard? No danger to you, sir. Bingo, I know it's down here, you're dealing with the unknown, just like in the real world, okay? If they go into a situation where they shouldn't shoot, someone turns on them even though they're startled, and they don't shoot, okay, again, stimulus, no threat, conditioned response, don't shoot, reward, good job! Did you shoot him? Sir, no, sir. No, you didn't. About 30% of the people come through here from novice recruit to 30th veteran, 30% on average shoot him up. He's got no gun, but he's got a badge. And they shoot him. You did good. You did real good here. Real good. Come on. See what else you did. See what else you did. Immediately after completing the course, the officers are debriefed on what they have just been through. What you're experiencing right now, Bill, is, is a memory, a false training memory. Okay? You actually had one hand on a gun. We talked earlier about making people do jumping jacks and running to get the breathing up and heart rate up. That's a different type of stress. That's physical induced stress. What we're looking at here is psychological induced stress. And when we take our people through the House of Horror, consistently, time after time after time, no matter how many times they've gone through it, we get those same results. We get the heavy breathing and the sweating, and they're just walking through it. But now it's psychological induced. So now we're mirroring the reality of what they experience in the real world facing threats. What did you see that made you shoot this guy here? The firearm. Sure. What did you see that made you shoot the guy with a knife? The knife, the weapon. What did you see that made you not shoot the cop who turned on you? The badge. The badge. I saw, I saw, I saw. In real life, unlike the target range, where you know you're going to shoot the target and you can get on those sites, so, yes, in real life, your eyeballs are on them, looking for the gun, the knife, the badge, the information to let you know if it's time to do this or not. During the debriefing, the officer is simply walked back through the course and asked to relate to the instructor what he saw, heard, said, and did. Reports of tunnel vision, auditory selectivity, false memories, and memory gaps are the norm. By experiencing these effects and being given the opportunity to understand them better through these experiences, officers gain true knowledge of the effects through their own bodies, their own eyes. Good job. Good work. Good job. Okay. What kind of gun did he have? It was a handgun. I think it was a silver handgun. Silver handgun? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Semi-auto. Semi yeah. Semi-auto. Semi-automatic. Okay. I could you identify it again if you saw it? Uh, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think that was a semi-automatic handgun. Okay. Silver semi-automatic handgun. Yeah. Here's your guy. It's not a silver semi-automatic. It's a, it's a dark oh. revolver. All right. But you can see how confused, how easy it is to get confused. So yeah. if he ran away and threw the gun down or whatever, or always stop him, and now he doesn't have the silver semi-automatic. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But this is so common. It's just, it's just confusion, and the brain's filling in some uh, gaps here. This is the heart of the whole program right here, is the House of Horrors component. And this is where the true training and the true learning occurs. If you don't have the fourth level, and if it's not constructed properly, and if there are no true threats perceived by the person going through it, it's an old paradigm program. And again, little tunnel vision. Get some tunnel vision going here. Normal, very normal. Now, how many hands did you have wrapped around your pistol when you shot this guy? One or two? I think I hit two. Sure you do, sure you do. 
Would you write that in your report? If they asked you, how many hands did you have wrapped around your gun? I probably, yeah, I have to. Sure, sure. But in reality, you didn't have two hands, you had one hand on the gun. Okay. Do you believe me? <laughs> you were behind me, yes. I wouldn't believe anybody, yeah. okay? Yeah. I can show you. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Use your finger gun and show me how you shot. Here, what did you do? I just pulled in. Right yeah, like and how many hands do you have on your gun? Sir, one, sir. That's right. There's a huge difference between understanding something or, or knowing something and understanding it through doing it, through, through experience of performance. Okay? You may look at a downhill skier making the big jump, uh, like the watch does up the big lift, and you go, wow, that must feel like something, and boy, that would be interesting, and you might have the idea of how to do it, but until you do it, you don't really get it. You don't really experience it, and you don't understand all the little subtleties in it and, and the not so subtleties in it, you know? The exhilaration, the feeling, you don't get that thinking about it. So just teaching someone how to do something, even teaching someone how to shoot a gun is one level of training. Teaching them how to make the gun go bang, teaching them how to hit a target is another level, but you can talk all day about you may have to use this weapon to shoot another person, but until they experience it or experience something close to it, a high, high fidelity simulation, they're not going to really understand it. It might be easy to hit a target, shoot a target, but then when you have a human being in front of you, you might feel a tremendous resistance. What are you going to do? He's going to... Put the gun down! Good job, good job, good job, good job, good job. Okay, good, good job, good job. This was my toughest one. Why was that? Um, because I, I couldn't see exactly what... Um, it, I mean, it looked like a gun to me, but I wanted to make sure before I actually did anything. Sure. I gave him some commands. Yep. He didn't He didn't reply to my commands. Mm -hmm. He didn't drop the gun. Mm -hmm. uh, so at that point, I had to stop the threat. Did you feel threatened? Um, well, I mean, I, the gun was continuing to point at me, and he wasn't dropping it, so yeah, I felt like... Yeah, absolutely. Could he have shot you? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And that's why I realized at that point, when he's not li listening to me mm -hmm. my commands, I decided to, mm -hmm. to end the threat. Okay, you did really, really good here, and I'll tell you this, you were also lucky, like happens in life sometimes, because he has a gun, and he shoots, but his gun didn't fire, misfired. Right, right. So, okay, but you did great. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I realized as after I shot, it's like I probably should have shot just a, a, a little bit earlier. You think so? The end result we found of this um, is that when people well, yeah, leave, a lot of times I've had people call me up on the way home from training, call me up on the way home from training to tell me, uh, that, was, that was really good, that was really, really good. I, I don't know why I can't explain it, but I feel really good. And all of a sudden, you've taken someone who may have been a little jittery and nervous run short, and you've given them confidence, given them experiences, and now they feel more capable, and they're more confident. And that is the end objective we're looking for. Capable, confident, safer, more effective police officer. And once you've achieved that, once the person believes that they can use their gun if they need to to save themselves or to save someone else, then the chances of them panicking go way, way down. They're diminished because they've got that confidence. The chances of them making a mistake, well, you can never eliminate them because we're only human, but the chances of them making a mistake in the real world are reduced. And there's nothing better than that because, again, the ultimate objective is saving lives, saving lives on both sides of the bed. The basic text for this series is the book Police Pistolcraft, the reality-based new paradigm of police firearms training, available from Sabre Press.